The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So I, I, in some ways, I won't be able to uh, compete with live demonstrations of children from last week. Uh, but I will try to uh, talk about adult development. And we will really sweep through uh, your minds and brains from when you were not yet born until you're going to be in your 90s, OK? So, so uh, here's your life uh, from the beginning to, to, uh, to the end, uh, uh, you know, viewed in different ways. And we'll touch on it a number of different topics. So you know this uh, question of it. People have talked for a long time about this, the development that one goes throughout one's life. What walks on four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, and three legs in the evening? You know the answer to this, right? People, right? They're crawling, they're standing up, and then you get to my age, and we, we need an extra little prop to move around successfully, right? And so uh, sort of thinking about this, that different things matter to people at different ages, that there's different priorities, different uh, ways of thought. Eric Erickson is often given credit for trying to articulate that. And we'll just walk through it for a moment, where he said, oh, at different ages, in infancy, early childhood, through school, adolescence, young adulthood, you know, people are dealing with different kinds of issues and different developmental tasks in front of them, that your life is a constant development, not maybe as dramatic as infancy, where we saw last time that children really see the world differently. Uh, but there's different challenges in front of you at, at all ages. And so, you know, at, at infancy, you're deciding who can you trust, who can you love, is it a good world, right? Uh, uh, and then the, the drama of uh, potty training, independence, you know, how much are you becoming a free agent in the world? Um, Early school, you start to interact with other children and, and play and make friendships and think about social groups. Uh, you know, later in school, as you're becoming more advanced in terms of what you're learning in school and more complex in terms of the social networks that you're developing. Uh, the much discussed, and we'll come back to this at the end, period of a high anxiety and drama of um, adolescence. Uh, uh, then, uh, uh, you know, the, something about young adulthood. You may have heard it recently, people have been speculating that what used to be the beginning of young adulthood culturally, at least in the US and maybe Europe and uh, industrialized parts of the world, that whereas the 20s used to be considered a, a decade of adulthood, there's now theories floating around or impressions floating around. The 20s are the new adolescence. Okay, what do you guys think? <laughs> you know, everybody says, oh, my 20s, I'm gonna discover this, I'm gonna discover that, but when I get to 30, that's when we're playing for keeps. Is that, is that, is that, is that? What do you, what, is that? <laughs> is, yeah? Well, I, in part it's because you live longer on average, or you count on living longer, and you do on average live longer, right? For a person who's counting on living to 90, which many of you are sort of, another decade of finding your way, your 20s, seems reasonable, right? In a world where people didn't live nearly as long, didn't have as many options, you know, time you finish college, it's a role, you know, or many people didn't go to college, just roll up your sleeves and get to adulthood. So uh, there's been all these uh, sort of magazine discussions that are the 20s, the new teens, okay? Uh, in terms of whether people feel they have responsibilities they have to execute as a young adult. Uh, and then, and, and this is a little bit timed also, that from, you know, a little bit anachronistic, because, you know, then having a family, although I think, you know, we're much more thinking about that's not necessarily the route for everybody uh, at all. Uh, and then old age, where you give other people lots of advice, okay? <laughs> uh, so we're going to talk about brain development uh, from infancy to young adulthood, uh, 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 cognitive stability and decline in adulthood. We've talked a little bit about that, talk a bit more. Uh, alterations in hemispheric specialization that come with aging. Uh, a bunch of remarkable results about exercise in the brain. All of us want, as we get older, or just even when you're younger, maybe, just a pill, you pop, and you're all ready to go, right? <laughs> that would be the best. Uh, it turns out there's remarkable evidence about what ec physical exercise does for the brain. And I'll show that with you, especially in regards to aging, but at all ages. Ideas about how, as you get older, your social and emotional goals will tend to change. A little bit about rewards, and a little bit about back to adolescence, and some rethoughts about what's going on in the adolescent mind and brain. 
So we know if there's one thing about the brain that's stunning uh, and challenging to grasp and empowers us to be humans, it's its complexity. Huge number of neurons, fantastic number of connections among the neurons. Uh, so this just phenomenal complexity that all starts, right, with a single cell. And how does the brain become this dramatically complex organ? And how does it organize in the right way to let you be an effective learner, an effective partner in your family, and so on? Um, so we start with the idea of neurogenesis, a magical word, the neurons being born. Uh, and they have to make this, make this crawl. There's a huge path for the size of a neuron from the ventricular surface, the ventricle, the fluid fill space, to get to uh, the place you're going to be in the brain. It's a huge adventure per neuron. Um, cells dividing there. The earliest neurons are, are existing about the second embryonic week, so that's uh, when you began to produce your neurons in your brain. Uh, by the seventh embryonic week, so you're just two months of pregnancy, you're producing 500,000, an estimated 500,000 neurons a minute. We said a neuron is kind of like a moderate computer, except unlike iPhones, it can't keep track of where you're going all the time, right? Uh, but uh, we said it's a, it's a moderate computer. Uh, so. Um, uh, 500,000 of those every minute, I mean, it's staggering, right? That it all works out is staggering. Um, peak uh, uh, by the 18th week, you've mostly made all the neurons you're ever going to make for the rest of your life, except in two brain regions. And there's a de big debate in the last decade but about another brain region. I'll share those with you. But people have been taught for many, many, many years in medical school, in college, in graduate school, that all the neurons you get are by the 18th week, so hang on to them through healthy living and wise behavior, right? Because <laughs> you have what you have, right? So don't lose them. But we'll talk about that you lose the vast majority of them anyway, naturally. Uh, I still recommend healthy living. Right? Uh, uh, because you know, perhaps, from other courses, that the brain does this wild thing, that it, it excessively overproduces by massive scales the number of neurons and the connections among the neurons. And then through use, it uh, gets rid of neurons and gets rid of connections among neurons, right? Exactly the opposite way if you built a building. If you build a building, what do you do? You construct every bit of it you need and you're done. What you don't do is say, I need a two-story building, so I'm going to do a 40-story building or a 90-story building and then knock off the stories as they're not needed. You say, well, that's wild. Why would I do that, right? But the brain brilliantly makes many more neurons and many more connections on epic scales and then only uses the ones that seem to be useful for the functions of the brain. Um, and so for that reason, uh, the number of uh, the, the density of the neurons in the brain is much higher in a two-year-old than in you, where it was much higher when you were two than it is now, OK? So in a two-year-old, they have 55% more uh, gray matter density in the frontal lobe than, th than adults, even at age five, even at age seven, they're 10% more. So you're constant, from a peak of around uh, before birth, you're constantly shedding neurons and their connections and keeping the ones that seem to be effective somehow. Now, for many years, people have said, is there neurogenesis in the adult brain? Is everything you get before you're born, and that's pretty much it? Uh, and there's many reasons to be interested in that. One is just, how does the brain work? How do people work? The second is for diseases, like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and other diseases, we would love to replace neurons that have died to help people do better. So can the brain make new neurons past, uh, uh, before birth? Uh, there's compelling evidence in animals and some indirect evidence in people, too, that neurogenesis does consider, continue into adulthood in the olfactory bulb and in a particular part, and I'll come back to this, of the hippocampus, a small part of the hippocampus called the dente gyrus. Everybody's in pretty much agreement on this for the moment. Which is kind of interesting. Why those two areas, amongst all the areas in the brain, what makes them different that they can produce neurons all throughout your life? Uh, and then about a decade ago, Elizabeth Gould of Princeton said, oh, you know, when I do the right kind of experiment, I see new neurons in the prefrontal cortex of monkeys, of, uh, you know, infrahuman primates. That was a giant revolution. Because they said, wait a minute, maybe. If you know, monkeys are doing it, people might be doing it, making neurons throughout their life. We just didn't know that. It's not so easy to measure, OK? If you think about it, the kind of experiment to know for certain if a human is making a new neuron is not so easy. Because brain imaging is very far from the single neuron level. And even if we saw a neuron, how could we tell it's new? So, uh, and then 
there's, you know, Pascal Rakic, a sort of big developmental researcher at Yale, said that what she really thought, what she really saw was glia. The glia are the other, neuro, other cells in the brain, not the neurons. They support uh, the neurons. Everybody agrees that you make glia all through your life. All right? There's no debate about that. But glia are not the stuff of thoughts and feelings. Neurons are. So what's, you know, what, do, what do we understand about that whole story? Here's an unbelievable experiment, I think. Or it's really not an experiment, but it's, it's a measurement. Uh, so here's, you know, uh, published in 2006, as one approach to asking, do adults make new neurons? And so the nuclear bomb tests that occurred during the Cold War sent a carbon-14 into the atmosphere from 1955 to 1963 until there was an international test ban treaty, and then these decreased and stopped. But there was a lot of nuclear bomb testing in the late 50s and 60s. That released carbon-14 into the atmosphere, and that integrates with DNA and forms a date mark for the cell of a birth. Okay? So this is not an experiment we would want to do again, which have you know, atmospheric nuclear testing and having nuclear stuff floating around in the atmosphere. right? But I'll tell you the bottom line, then I'll show you how they figured this out. Uh, what they figured out is looking at people who died uh, a few years ago, uh, that non-neuronal cells are generated. That was found before. Glial cells are made throughout your lifetime, is the inference from the finding. But neurons are not generated in adult neocortex. The commentary in this article said, no new neurons for you. <laughs> okay, not quite true. We know these two little areas in the brain do it, but not in most of the brain. And they also looked at something called uh, uh, BIRDU, BRDU, which is another way to take a brain if you have it uh, that you can, and it marks newly synthesized DNA. So if you have the brain directly to measure, you have a couple of measures of newly synthesized DNA, which would be the marker of new neurons. So here's the fantastically interesting thing. They took people who were born in different times, took post-mortem samples, and measured the carbon-14 relative to what was expected. The line here is relative to what was expected uh, by the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. Okay? So that's their, and here's what they found. If they look for somebody born after 1963, they have in their neurons exactly the amount that you would expect if they made all their neurons around, around here uh, and, the, and the decrease here d didn't affect the neurons at all. The glia are here, which is kind of an average of here and the rest of life. So if you average the average age of the glia, it was about the average age of the life of the person. The carbon was being picked up in the DNA because it's being made, it's being kept and being made. But the neurons all look like one value, the value that has to do with when you're born. All right? So it's not changing uh, the number of neurons that are showing the carbon-14, as if whatever you got at birth, that's it. Uh, on the other hand, here's somebody born before 1963, uh, having essentially zero carbon that's being showing up in their neuronal DNA, and having, again, the expected average glial DNA, as if glia kept going. So this is fantastic. This is looking at the carbon-14 in the DNA of neurons and glia and people who have passed away, and saying the carbon-14 dating looks like neurons, you get them all before you're born, that's it. Glia, you keep making. And they can look at it more directly by looking at this uh, uh, thing that shows you recent DNA, again, showing you impressively that glia keep making new glia with new DNA, but not neurons. So the current conclusion of the field, as far as anybody can tell, is no new neurons for you, <laughs> except in your dente gyrus and olfactory bulb. Um, now, Here's something fantastic, though. It appears that exercise, and I'll just show you one example in, in animals and humans. There's other things. Exercise will pump up the number of new neurons you make in the dente gyrus of the hippocampus. And we know the hippocampus is important for memory, so that's not a bad place to make new neurons. So you know that going to exercise you know, will strengthen you in various ways, but you never realized, unless you follow this line of work, that when you exercise, you're enhancing the number of new neurons that you're producing in your dente gyrus. So here's, two, here's a couple of ways people have approached this. So one way is to measure cerebral blood volume, how much blood is in the dente. And I'm going to show you evidence that mice that are allowed to exercise push up the blood volume. And that, that seems to go with direct evidence of neurogenesis, because you can do that in the animals. You can look at sacrificed animals. And then in humans, some indirect evidence uh, that exercise is, again, pushing up the blood volume in the dentate and pushing up a little bit memory abilities that go with that part of the brain. We can't go in and measure neurons uh, uh, in the humans. So here are mice who exercised or didn't exercise. They measured the blood volume. Here in red is the 
dentate part of the hippocampus. You can see it's the hottest spot for blood volume. Uh, and it's the only spot that responds to, to exercise. So they had some mice not get to exercise, some mice get to exercise. Uh, the blood volume increases within the hippocampus selectively in a small component of the hippocampus, the dentate gyrus. Exercise is pushing up the blood volume. Now, that's not direct evidence about what's happening at the cellular level, but they can sacrifice these animals and show you that uh, if they look at this binding uh, that goes with new neurons, with new DNA, uh, that's pushed up in the exercise animals. Here's the statistics. You know, here's the picture. Okay? So in the animals, they can relate directly uh, or correlate directly. More blood volume and more new neurons being going with more physical exercise. In humans, they could measure the blood volume, and so they had some people do more exercise, some people less exercise. Again, it's a dentate gyrus selectively that showed an increase in blood volume in humans. And now they give them a memory test, and it's not overwhelming, but at least in some cases, the people who did exercising, who pushed up their blood volume, also pushed up a little bit their memory performance. So in humans, it has to be more indirect, but all the data align with the idea that exercise is pushing up neuronal genesis, creation of new neurons in one of the two regions that everybody agrees we make new neurons, the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus. So, but cells have to go incredible distances of the cellular size. Neurons have to travel to the intended location. Migration occurs over many months, including uh, eight months postnatally. Here's this neuron following its little path to where it's going to go. Uh, uh, these, these glial tracks following molecular cues as to their ultimate target location to get it organized. Its initial destination and function are predetermined at the start of migration. People can measure things in these that tell you where this is going to end up. It's programmed in these cells. Uh, that unless there's a, something that blocks them, uh, that they know where they're going to go and make up different parts of the brain. Um, and then they form synapses, right? The part of where information is uh, sent from one neuron to another. Um, it occurs throughout the brain, uh, but at different rates in different areas. So very early, you see it in spinal cord. Uh, very late, you see it in higher cortical areas like prefrontal cortex. At the peak growth, there's an estimate, these are all you know, gross estimates, that there may be, you may be forming 1.8 million synapses per second. It's stunning, right? 1.8 million synapses per second. And do you know how many molecules are in an average synapse by current estimations? A thousand. There's a thousand different molecules in a synapse for it to do what it has to do. Multiply that times 1.8 million per second. It's spectacular biology. Um, and then they keep getting more and more until two years, and then you start to lose them. By, by, by age 16, you'll have lost a lot of them. And so the people have this idea we mentioned before, that pruning and selection, that we overgrow the number of neurons, the number of connections. Uh, what stays is activity dependence, or this use it or lose it neural Darwinism. Here's something amazing. There's an estimate and they, uh, you know, that we lose 20 billion synapses per day through adolescence. 20, you know, and that's not a bad thing. Okay, that's not the worst behaving adolescents doing the worst things they can do. That's the brain, uh, you know, getting rid of connections that aren't useful. It's an incredibly interesting way to construct a powerful brain is to get everybody, you can build a way overbuild, right, and then eliminate the ones that aren't powerfully useful. And another thing, another marker of, of, of development is myelination. That's the growth of the fatty sheath that surrounds uh, neurons that are extending distances. It insulates them and accelerates their signal. It looks like white matter in the postmortem brain. Um, what happens through adolescence, here's age 4 to 22, is that white matter goes up and gray matter goes down. So quite interestingly, the, the total brain size from about age 6 to about 20, young adulthood, most of you, stays about the same, the total brain size. What you're doing is you're getting rid of gray matter and you're enhancing white matter. You're getting rid of the neurons that are non-productive and the synapses that are non-productive, and you're increasing the strength with which different parts of the brain can communicate with one another through the white matter. And so here's the kinds of pictures of, of this growth uh, and some, some of the parts of the brain that mature latest by these kinds of measures of getting rid of the overgrowth are in prefrontal cortex, and we've talked about that before. So people are interested in, in, in always in thinking about developmental issues in the biology of them. And here's a kind of a stunning finding. Um, and uh, we don't know exactly how it would relate to humans, but I thought it would be interesting to share with you and think about this just a little bit. So the title of the paper in science was Good Memories of Bad Events in Infancy. 
So we know from before, and just every common sense, that fear is important for the survival, right? So we studied the amygdala, which seems essential for learning what's to be feared. Because what's to be feared is what injures you or, worst case, could kill you. Uh, so the amygdala is essential for learned fear. And we know that one example of fear conditioning that depends on the amygdala would be a neutral stimulus like an odor, you know, an odor that's not particularly good or bad, just an odor, and then a shock that makes it an aversive stimulus. So you pair them through conditioning, odor, shock, odor, shock, so the odor predicts the shock. Now, they looked at young rats uh, uh, and looked at attachment, and here's what they find kind of remarkably. Up to postnatal day nine for these rats, uh, if they are exposed to the odors and the shocks, here's what they do. They know through pairings, odor, shock, odor, shock, odor, shock, right? Here comes the odor, here comes the shock. They still approach the odors. That's what's in this graph. Up to nine days, the rats, the mice, sorry, who uh, are still approaching this odor even though it will lead to a shock. But on the 10th day, just one day later, it completely reverses and they avoid the odors that predict the shock. A complete reversal. So they keep going to the odors with the shock, and on the 10th day, the, the pups stop going there. Um, and what they also find is this. If they look at uh, metabolic activity in the amygdala, for the nine-day-olds, it's the same for the odor and the shock or a neutral odor. It's not selective to what's to be feared. And the 10-day-old, here's a big response in the amygdala for the odor that predicts the shock, for the fearful learning, to know what's scary and injurious and dangerous. Uh, so how do people think about this? Well, this is an animal experiment up to nine days. We can't really know how it relates to people. Um, but the speculation was this, and maybe there's something to it on a, on a different scale in people. Why would an animal approach something injurious up to the amygdala seems to get more mature and then avoid what's injurious? Why would that happen in such a predictable, evolutionary determined you know, uh, way? And the hypothesis is this, that if you're a very helpless newborn, you have to go to uh, uh, things no matter what, OK? <laughs> because you're so dependent on things in your environment to survive. But at some moment, you mature enough uh, that you say, no, thank you. If it's going to be shocking and painful, I'm going to avoid it, OK? You become kind of independent in that sense, in a, in a concrete sense. And so the author said, well, so could it be helpful for newborns to know what, no matter what, approach a caregiver, you know, not, not respond to things that are negative because you need the care because you're so dependent? And now this is super speculatively. A thing that's been noted is that even in families where there's unfortunate, tremendous abuse for a young child, the abuse victims so commonly remain powerfully loyal to their parents. Is this kind of a mechanism that mixes up attachment and fear, all right, especially when you're young? and can't separate them out so well. So it's a huge leap from the mice to the people, but it's a mechanism that we can understand might be involved in how attachment and fear can have unusual relationships with one another. All right. You, you, you can't avoid reading in the newspapers or seeing on, on, the, on your computer screen discussions about the deficit and older people like me demanding a lot of medical care that's paid for by the wages you're going to get in a couple of years, right? OK? <laughs> all right. All right. I mean, that's how I look at it. Okay. So uh, all right. I mean, I'm, you know, all right. So you are entering a world, we're all entering a world where the changing ages, the demography of our society is spectacular. Japan is ahead of us in this a little bit. The rest of the world is following. And China is going to be unbelievable when it happens on scale. But the United States right now, OK, right now, and here's why. For most of human history, the average life expectancy was up to 20 years old. That's why you had to be an adult, right? Because a 20 go, like, who knows how much time I have, right? <laughs> Better do my adult things, right? And it wasn't that people, some people lived for a long time. This is really interesting. It wasn't that everybody perished by 30. It was that some people lived to 60, 70, 80, uh, 90. But many people fell ill to many diseases that are now readily cured. So the average age was 20. 1800s, it became the 30s. That's you know, just a couple hundred years ago in all of human history. By 2000, the average person in the US lived till 77. Uh, by 2010, 78. So we're having a spectacular growth in the proportion of humans in our society who are living a long, long time, which is a wonderful thing, right? <laughs> OK, but it's radically changing the world we live in and the world for those people who are older as well. 
So, for example, 100-year-old people, there's 50,000 of them in the US, which is triple what there was a time ago. And it's expected to be a million people in the US who are 100 years and older by 2050, which is in your lifetime, OK? A million people in the US alone who will be 100 or older. Um, and maybe 50% of girls born in 2000 will live for a century. All right? Spectacular changes are occurring right this moment. Okay? The baby boom generation, huge numbers of us are approaching you know, retirement and the kind of medical support that gets heavier when you get older on average. Huge numbers of us. Um, how is that changing? One way it's changing is that families often have, and you might hear this issue of families feeling that they're sandwich generation. They're taking care of their children and their elderly. And you can bet if you have parents who are living to 120, you're doing that, OK? <laughs> All right? Uh, uh, giant effects on education, pension, work, financial markets. I mean, these are epic societal effects that you're hearing the discussion now about how the US is going to deal with this. Uh, so the, there used to be kind of an old model. And this, even this is not that old. This is from the mid-1950s, you know, where you, uh, your job was to uh, you know, go to college, uh, have a career, have a mate, take care of a kid, retire at 65, and put your feet up on the desk, right? But all of a sudden, if everybody's living, not everybody, but huge numbers of people are living till 70, 80, 90, 100, many in pretty good health, not everybody we wish for, but many in pretty good health, that's a fantastically different thing. 65 is no longer the retirement moment, and you're glad you made it. 65 is something like the halfway point of your potential work life, all right? 20 to 60, 60 to 100, you know, something like this, right? OK? I mean, it's an unbelievable change. You cannot overestimate how it's changing the world around you and how it will affect the economics and politics of the world that the rest of us will be in and you for many years. Uh, there's about 10% of the population over 65 now. In 20 years, one out of every four people will be over 65 by current estimates. Right. So we're going to elect whatever president we want, okay? <laughs> All right. And older people go vote a lot more than younger people. You can change that, but that's how it is. Uh, so let's talk about adult development. Uh, uh, I can tell you that if you compare adult development, for, uh, very little is understood from 20 to 80. Almost all the research is taking something like college students and something like 80-year-olds and comparing them. So this is pretty much minimal information is available about everything between 20 and 80. But we'll look at what we can. And one of the things we'll talk about for a moment is uh, the two kinds of studies we can look at for development. This could be about infants, but we're going to talk about adults. Uh, cross-sectional versus longitudinal. So cross-sectional is I look at you as 20-year-olds. I look at eight, some 80-year-olds in the Boston community, compare them. That's very different than looking at you at 20 and seeing you at 80. Right? Because that's much more controlled. That's you with everything that's special and particular about you at 20 and 80. When you go get people who are 20-year-olds from one place and 80-year-olds from another, a cross-sectional study, uh, uh, that's going to um, you know, have all the differences that go with those cohorts. So uh, what, are the, what do we see in these kinds of things? Sorry. Um, so here's, here's some measures. You've seen this kind of system before. For things like working memory, speed of processing, long-term memory, here's people in their 20s, people in their 80s, a ski slope of uh, decline. Here's things like knowledge of vocabulary, and that stays more steady. So the crystallized fluid distinction you've already heard about before. So what are the strengths and limitations of cross-sectional versus longitudinal studies? So for cross-sectional studies, they're fast. If you're a scientist, like a graduate student, who has to do a PhD thesis in the mayor six or seven years, OK? You can go to an experiment with 20-year-olds and 80-year-olds and have a conclusion. If you're a graduate student who would have to test this class at 20, and come back to you in 60 years from now and see how you're doing, all right? It's going to be slow progress, OK? So that's why the overwhelming amount of evidence is cross-sectional. Uh, the problem with it is cohort effects. We discussed, for example, that IQ scores go up year by year throughout the world. So you're not really comparing equal things in terms of educational opportunities, nutrition, uh, exposure to information on the internet. A 20-year-old and an 80-year-old have lived through different worlds. Uh, so it's all mixed up in the measurement. It's not just age. It's different worlds that people have lived in. Longitudinal studies are, are painfully slow. They're more accurate because you're looking at change within a person. You're holding all the world things constant. You have one other weird thing, which is you get practice effects. If you test somebody in the same test 
Now, if 60 years apart, you don't get much, but if maybe three or four years apart, you take a test twice, you get better at it. So that's a problem with longitudinal effects where you retest somebody. So there's been a few studies that have looked at relatively short-term longitudinal and cross-sectional data. Um, and here's the ski slope on the values of uh, f f fluid intelligence things. And it's just made a bit milder by a longitudinal design, but not dramatically different. So it's not the case that longitudinal studies, the people used to think, oh, these longitudinal studies are overestimating that. Especially if you're older, you like that thought. You know, it's a messed up study approach. But unfortunately, cross-sectional ones just diminish the difference a little bit. So um, people have said, though, there's an interesting trade-off. What's the trade-off, then, and I'll ask you for a moment, between most of you are like 18 to 22, you know, I'll, I'll bracket it, 17 to 25, right? Most of you, is that fair? Okay. Okay. What advantage do you have versus somebody in their mid-50s like me? And what disadvantage do you have in some global sense? Oh, that was, that was painful. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the answer was, you guys are physically able. OK, all right. That, that would be true. Okay. You know, there's, there's not many Olympian sprinters who are in their mid-50s, right? OK. All right. Uh, so how about in terms of cognitive things? So we just said, for speed of mental processing, it's good to be 20. And then 30-year-olds are a little slower, 40-year-olds a little slower, 50, 60, 70, OK? Every decade a little bit slower for speed of mental processing. But there's one thing that's an advantage with time for cognition. What's the advantage? Sorry? Experience. Experience. Thank you. Oh, yes. OK. Uh, yes. You get to, you know, over time, you learn stuff especially stuff that you're, you know, you're exposed to a lot, right? So time is a trade-off between, in, within adulthood. You lose some speeded capacities. You gain some specific knowledge or experience. And so they looked at studies like these, air traffic controllers in Canada. Where, and this is very relevant because people are constantly thinking about what, especially now, air, air traffic controllers are in the news more than they want to be, right? You, you, right? You've seen them there. Unfortunately, they're napping. They're playing movies, some of them. I'm sure it's a tiny minority, but worrisome if you're a, a, a member of the flying public. Okay. So here's another question. At what age should you tell somebody, well, I think you know, we don't need you to be an air controller anymore because you're not with it enough for us to feel safe. Right? Um, so people are probing this all the time. So, uh, air, you know, so here, the average retirement age in the US is 55 and Canada 65. Is one more correct than the other? And so here's what they found when they looked at air traffic controllers. Uh, age influenced processing speed, but not task performance. So what we're thinking is, but older people aren't better, but they're not worse. Maybe there's a trade-off between speed and experience, and it kind of evens out until some age where it will no longer even out. 118 pilots, 40 to 69, they were, took flight place in flight simulators, tested three times across three years. So longitudinal design in a flight simulator. The older pilots were worse the first time they did it, now some time is passing, but then they outperformed the younger pilots in years two and three. That is, once they had some experience with the new situation, they could apply presumably their prior experience. But the very first time they did it, when they have to use their fluid intelligence to figure out what's going on, they were worse. So you can see some trade-offs between raw processing speed and flexibility that goes with young adulthood and some degree of knowledge and expertise that's gained over time. And so trade-offs on these things. Uh, how about in memory, declarative memory that we talked about, everyday memory? I'll show you in a moment. There's mild, steady uh, decline in healthy aging, severe in Alzheimer's. Implicit memory, we talked about that, you know, can be more steady across ages. But let me focus on explicit memory or declarative memory. Um, we're going to figure out what's, why the projector is washing these things out so much. But uh, here's a slide that you don't have to see very much to know. Long-term memory performance is going down, you know, quite sharply year by year as you get older. Uh, but here is something that was a huge surprise from brain imaging, a huge surprise. And the thing that if you didn't have brain imaging, you wouldn't even conceive that it could have existed. So many studies have done brain imaging as people perform various kinds of tasks, memory tasks in this case, with young adults and older adults. And what they found unexpectedly was this, uh, that young adults would uh, uh, typically activate one side of the prefrontal cortex, typically in regards to whether it was verbal or spatial. So here's young adults, mostly on one side, mostly on one side, uh, mostly on one side, mostly on one side. Healthy older adults in good health characteristically turned on both sides of the brain as they were performing these memory tasks. 
So you wouldn't have known that if you didn't have imaging, because who could have thought about that, right? So then there was a little bit of a debate in the field, where the fact that adults were turning on both sides of their hemispheres, whereas adults were just picking one or just using one, was that a good thing or a bad thing? So people said, well, it's a bad thing, because maybe as you get older, you lose your specializations, and you're using the wrong stuff, OK? It's as if I need my physics book, and I'm going to grab my chemistry book. Well, just grab your physics book, right? OK, right? Just grab the run right thing. Why are, you, why are you getting other stuff that's not relevant and could mess you up or slow you down? So some people said, you're sort of losing the specialization of peak young adulthood. You're leaking brain activity in the wrong places. It's yet another sad sign of getting older. Here's an alternative one. Well, you get older, but maybe you get some compensatory mechanisms. You realize at some level in your brain that you can't do what you could when you were 20, and you make up for that by somehow using two sides of your brain instead of one. Does that make sense? So that would be a good thing, right? So how would you decide that? How would you decide whether using the two sides of your brain when you're an older adult is a helpful thing, part of the solution to keeping your cognition going, or is it part of the problem of losing long-term memory abilities as you get older, they're declining? How would you decide that? There's kind of an easy answer. Sorry? You what? Yes, well, yeah, should we split the, you know, yeah, yeah, this is a suggestion we should take older people, split their brains, and see how they're doing. <laughs> yeah, all right. Well, older people are, their long term memory is not that bad. They're, they're sort of, yeah, so here's, here, was, here was the approach. It seems reasonable. They say um, amongst older people, some people do better and worse in terms of the memory. Does better memory with go with using two sides or one side, right? And what was found, here's one example. Here's young people using one side of their frontal cortex as they perform a memory task. Here's older people whose memory was not so good. Here's older people whose memory was good. And here's a similar finding. So the suggestion was that older people who used both frontal cortices were actually doing better. They were having less of an effective age on cognition. So the answer seems to be it's a good thing. And if you're older, you somehow compensate for some of the decrease in long-term ability by applying more neural systems to support your performance. Is it OK? So, now, what are some factors that, I mean, older adults are really interested in this. You're, you are not. In about 30 years, you might be. Uh, but older adults are really interested in, you know, what can I do to keep myself going since I'm going to live to be 80, 90, or 100 with any just a little bit of luck? How can I keep my quality of life high in terms of cognition and mental abilities? So one thing that people have found is that, on average, higher education is correlated with, and there's many inter interpretations of this, uh, better cognitive abilities and less likelihood of getting Alzheimer's or getting Alzheimer's if you're going to get it at an older age. Um, so that's kind of interesting. That's a good, good to go to college, good to keep being educated in some sense. It doesn't have to be formal, but formal education correlates with that. Um, now, here was a surprise, and now you tell me what it is. So how would that work? How would sitting there and listening to me really carefully right now give you an extra decade of cognitive ability when you're 80? OK. All right, now I've got your attention. So I mean, how would that work biologically? Like, you know, is education kind of going in your brain and saying, you know, we're, we're knocking all these things in and keeping them here, and we're not going to let you have any injury when you're 40 or 50? How does that work? OK. So I'm going to tell you one more piece of information, which is this, and then you tell me what you think. Uh, so the other thing that, that we know is there's evidence that once you get the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, then the higher, the more educated you are, the faster you decline. And I don't think the story is all done yet, because people are complicated. But this is, this is the current evidence. So how do you interpret that? So here's the interpretation. The interpretation is more education gives you more mental tools, what people will call cognitive reserve. You have more things going for you, like maybe the ability to use two hemispheres. That will protect you as something like some brain injury happens over time, like an Alzheimer's disease or other causes of slowed or, or diminished cognition in old age. That will help you. You have more tools with which to keep operating successfully. But once Alzheimer's disease becomes severe enough in the brain that those tools are no longer available to you, then the more educated you are, the more you plummet. Because you know, everything is done. So we now know something, and I'll just say a word about that Alzheimer's disease, and this is compelling evidence for this, starts in your brain um, about 15 years before you get the diagnosis. 
about, and, and it could be more than that. That's how far we can track it back by brain imaging. So if, a, if, a, if a, an adult is diagnosed with Alzheimer's at 70, somewhere around 55, something has started uh, that will, you know, will ultimately be injury enough to be, lead to dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Um, and that's why there's such a big emphasis on early identification, because it's very hard to treat a brain that's had a lot of injury. You want to you catch the people at 55 or 60. So we also know that lifelong cognitive activity is good. Conscientious, we, we talked about that. And here again comes exercise, OK? <laughs> um, so, uh, so they took a study. This is, this is now a random assignment study, finally a full-on experiment, where they took relative, relative they took sedentary people, people who were not exercising over 60, and assigned them to two groups, uh, an aerobic training group who was, did walking and swimming, so some real exercise, and a non-aerobic group who did toning and stretching. So they, were, they thought they were special, they were active, but they weren't doing the aerobic exercise. Uh, and, and they didn't do it a phenomenal amount of time, an hour a day, a few times a week for months. It's not a brutal exercise schedule. Uh, what happens? It's kind of amazing what happened. These are healthy people, but not very active. What's shown here in the red bars, are the cognitive performances after the, after the exercise of the healthy older people, and blue bars are the people who did the stretching and toning, not the aerobic exercise. So very substantial gains in cognitive abilities from a few months of moderate exercise. And in the brain, both by functional MRI and by structural MRI, in gray matter and white matter, physically measurable changes in the brain for the group that did the aerobic exercise a couple times a week, you know, uh, for a few months compared to the group that did the sedentary exercise, the le less active exercises. That's amazing. Brain changes, uh, cognition changes. Uh, again, not, no pill you can pop. Uh, and you're making new neurons in your dente gyrus to boot, right? So it's kind of, you know, now all of us want the easy out, but exercise is the most compelling story uh, uh, for keeping your brain optimized that we know. Now, here's a remarkable thing. So exercise we kind of get. Actually, if you think about it, we don't know the mechanism at all, OK? I mean, you know, you're running around like this. Now, how is that pushing up your neurons in your brain? But here's something very psychological that's kind of stunning. And at first, I almost didn't believe it when I read it, but there's been a few other studies that have supported this. We often think, well, exercise is something like real. Attitudes, even in a psychology course, attitudes are just kind of, they're just attitudes, OK? So look at this, and then you, you can think about this. So they looked in a longitudinal study of 400 people, over 400 uh, uh, in the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging. They started under 50, but they've kept going with them. They gave them a questionnaire on attitudes about aging. So they said, are older people, for example, more absent-minded or less intelligent? And some people are, you know, say, oh, oh my gosh, older people are very absent-minded. They're very less intelligent, other people think it's just a milder thing. People vary in their estimates of how severe these changes are in old age. Then they measured something very concrete and real, the number of cardiovascular events, uh, like stroke or heart attack, over the next 38 years. OK? So this is a real physical measurement. This is an attitude. How powerful is an attitude? Well, it's kind of stunning, unbelievably powerful in some ways. We don't know if it's the attitude or something correlated. But here's the uh, percent with cardio strokes or heart attacks. Here's the people who had negative age stereotypes. And here's the people who had positive age stereotypes. So one always has to be worried about this, a chicken and egg issue. You know, maybe if you've had a lot of strokes and heart attacks, you're not so optimistic about your old age, right? But they were measuring these things uh, at the beginning. They were very similar. So that they weren't starting out with different health problems. So something about attitudes seems to chip in to the most core aspects of physical health, but none of us understand the mechanism. Yes? That's a good, so the question is, how about family history? It could be mixed into that, yes. Yep, that's a very good point. Then it's not just attitudes, right? Or it could be not attitudes at all, <laughs> okay. That's a, uh, so, here, and here's the concept, that regardless of your age, but age is the, one of the most powerful uh, story, pieces of the story, when your time is limited, people focus on social goals related to emotional meaning and emotional satisfaction, and less related to knowledge acquisition. That depending on the moment of your life on average, you know, when you're in adolescence and you're in college and graduate school and you're beginning your residency or becoming a you know, junior partner in a law firm, you're in an age of huge uh, information acquisition. What you want to know is, what do I need to know to do something important, significant, valuable in my life, right? Right? You're sitting here acquiring knowledge. Colleges, 
you know, four years of acquiring knowledge in terms of classrooms and majors, right? You guys do other things too, but the number one mission is acquire that knowledge. Right? Uh, now when you get older, you know, you don't really want so much information anymore. And maybe what you're much more interested in is how you regulate your feelings. How, how positive can you make your life? Right? Not by being adventurous, taking risks and all this kind of stuff, but by finding a way towards happiness. And I'm going to show you a bunch of research that suggests that young adulthood is full about acquisition of information through adventure. Uh, and old age, you regulate your, emo that you're, you switch, on average, you're focused to regulate your emotions in positive ways. And so sometimes people will call that wisdom, although you could, you could just say it's different things for different ages are desirable. And part of this support came from the following result, which has been found many, many, many times, but was kind of stunning when it was first reported. So this is where, where people were asked, how happy are you? Are you satisfied with your life? So here's younger adults, 18 to, to 50, basically. About half of them say they're very satisfied, but it zooms up uh, if you're older. How many people are satisfied with their standard of living? 40 if you're younger, 60 if you're older. Frequency of depression, for example, never. Uh, let's, let's, let's pick uh, often. Higher for younger people. Uh, more frequent thoughts about suicide. Every, by every measure you can make, if we give you a questionnaire like this on average for 20-year-olds or 30-year-olds, you report more unhappiness okay, than older people. On average, of course, it varies. Okay? But that's kind of a surprise, maybe, or not. Okay, and that's everybody has found that. Not, not a surprise. I mean, just because you report something doesn't mean that's the way it is. Ah, well, we'll come back to this again. Yes, just because you say you're happier doesn't mean you're happier. Yeah, we don't have a better way than that, though. Okay, <laughs> you know? we can't say, "Oh, you think you're happy, but you'd be so happy if you were a Caltech." You know, you'd be just so happy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, you know, this is one of the measures. You know, I'm, I, I'm a brain measurer, so I like objective. The measures. Uh, I think if a person tells you they're happy, they probably are. Uh, there's, there's certain moments I know when people tell you that. Well, we'll see. Who knows? I agree with you. It's a concern. Um, so here's the thought. That motivation and goals are set by temporal context. That time is perceived as limited. Uh, and all this will come that the older you get, the more you focus on positive things in the world. And what makes you happy is the thought, is to focus on positive things and ignore the negative. So how true might this be experimentally? So they had students. Oh, this is really washed out. Capture these uh, special moments, the same ad, and this one says, capture, so capture the special moments, and this one says, uh, capture the unexplored world. So if you're an information seeker, which is better, the unexplored world or the special moments? Which is better? Unexplored world, right? You're a 20 year old. Unexplored is awesome. <laughs> Young people prefer this ad, older people prefer the special moments. And special moments we aim emotionally satisfying, right? OK. Here's another one. They show you uh, pictures of a positive and a negative expression. It flashes away, and there's a dot left. And you simply put, if the dot appears on the right, you push your right hand button. If the dot appears on the left, you push the left hand button. It's simply pushing to a dot. But the dot is in the place where you just saw either a negative or a neutral face. And what they find is, for younger people, they're about as fast. Whether the dot appears where the neutral or negative face was, they don't really care. For the older people, they're much faster if the dot appears where the positive face had just been, as if their attention was locked to the positive face. Oh, the dot appears there. I'm ready to go. Locked to the positive face. If the dot appears here, you go, whoa, 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 and you shift your attention, and that takes extra time. So you're locked to the positive when you see a positive and a negative face. Here's another one where you're asked, um, you're given a positive and negative car options, things that are good or bad about a car. This line goes up, this line goes down. Younger people focus more on the negative options relative to older people who focus more on the positive options. Here's another one. You show pictures of happy scenes or neutral scenes or negative scenes. This is a graveyard. Uh, young people's uh, uh, memory for positive, negative, and neutral things, they remember emotional things better. And let's go to the older people. Look at this line way up here. That's memory for the positive scenes, and here's the negative scenes. Do you see the focus on the positivity and the sort of lack of interest in the negative stuff? Right? For young people, equally interesting if it's positive or negative. For older people, much more interesting and sticking in your memory if it's positive and not sticking in your memory if it's negative. Um, so one of the big questions is, is this simply about getting older? And I'm going to ask you to think back, if I can, to your last days in high school. Your last days in high school. For those last days, 
and I'm sure it will vary depending on your experience in, in different ways, were you primarily interested in getting that last little bit of information about US history or calculus? I mean, you might have been. That could be the critical bit of information that will make college work out. Or, or did you have a sudden, and it's kind of embarrassing when you're 16, 17, 18, enhanced sense of nostalgia? Oh, this is the last time that the three of us, or the six of us, or the eight of us, or the two of us will be together. Then we're spreading across the world to go to different colleges. Nobody had that feeling? OK. It's kind of embarrassing when you're 18, because you're not supposed to say that kind of stuff, all right? And it will happen to you at the end of college, for most of you most of the time. I remember senior year crept up on us in college, and we started college and go, oh my gosh, this is the last year we're together, and it seemed very emotionally important. Okay. All right, so age or time. So if it's, is it simply age or is it time? So they did experiments where they asked people, are you focusing on you know, adventure and content, or are you focusing on emotion and satisfaction? When you're about to move from one city to another, people wanted to spend time with people they really cared about, and they were not interested in getting new information. More two more sort of tragic studies. If people are near death and they ask this question, of course, time with people, not acquiring information. But here's another one. Inner city gangs, study in Los Angeles. Inner city gangs that are involved in violence, much more interested in time with people than in information. And you know, partly that goes with what is viewed from the outside, you know, uh, sometimes as kind of the insane loyalty that inner city gang members have for one another. It's because they're so focused, given their situation, on this relations with the other people in their group compared to everything that's rational about a safe, you know, growing up, right? Okay? So it's not, and tragically, you know, if you ask a member of inner city gangs how long they think they'll live, they often tell you, not very long. I'm counting on not living very long, right? So it's not whether you're 20 or 60 or 80, it's how long you sense time is in front of you, um, a temporal horizon. So here's one study where uh, uh, the, 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 I, I had a hand in, where we took older and younger people and put them inside a, a, a MRI and showed them positive, neutral, and negative pictures. Here's a couple of different points. When they said, how intense is this picture? Look at younger people. Positive, neutral, and the negative are really intense. Look at this goes down, so the older people, as they see the pictures experienced by their own report, the negative pictures is being less intense. All right? they're, they're sort of downplaying the negative. And if we ask their memory, here's younger people, positive and negative things, neutral things, same for positive and negative. Look at older people, much more focused in memory, retaining in memory the positive and not so much the negative. And if we look in their amygdala, which we know is a structure that's essential for how Emotion modulates the formation of memory. Here's young people. Here's a positive picture. Here's a negative picture. Here's a neutral picture. So emotion counts. Positive and negative count about the same. Look at older people. Here's positive and here's negative. Okay. So this partly addresses the question, like, for some people, like, are older people pretending they're positive? Well, it doesn't look like that, right? This is their amygdala as they're looking at it. I mean, I don't know if their amygdala can pretend <laughs> to look at the positive, right? So. Here's the good news for you. What will happen as you get older, on average, is that for whatever reason it happens, and we don't really know why, we, you will focus more and more on the positive things in your life. And you'll feel better for that, on average. So that's a kind of quiet satisfaction. Oh, I'm focusing on the positive. That's the Zen satisfaction. Let's talk about fantastic satisfaction, the reward system, right? When you really want to do something, because it's really wonderful, it's going to feel so wonderful, the reward system. So let me tell you a little bit about what we understand about that. Uh, it involves dopamine. It's a critical neurotransmitter. Starts in the ventral tegmental area of your brainstem, and that projects to something called the nucleus accumbens, an inferior portion of the basal ganglia. And this is reward central. If you love something from opera to chocolate to video games, this turns on. Every experiment that people have ever done uh, shows in humans, if something really turns you on, this area really gets turned on. All right? I mean, what's more powerful for us than what we find deeply emotionally rewarding? This is that reward system. Um, and the dopamine runs from there. Uh, there and, but, and look at how cells respond. So I'm going to show you an example from monkeys where we could look at single cells and, uh, that, and then brain imaging back to people. So. Here's the experiment with monkeys. And there's, some, there's a message in this that's both biologically true and I think compelling about human life. All right? so, uh, so biologically true is a science that compelling about life is a, is a story. Right? So here's the experiment. 
the monkey sits there and gets various cues, different visual things that tell them what's coming up. Let's pretend this is a cue that something wonderful is coming up, highly desired food. Right? So they, they're recording electrically while the animal sees this. They're waiting for it, what we can call the anticipation period. And now here comes the reward. And here's something sort of deep, I think, about reward and learning and people and things like this. So here's the neurons firing. This is the, average, this is the sum of the neurons firing in the ventral tegmental area. So right now, they're just sitting there. And, Whoops, here comes the reward. Here's R. And boom, dopamine is released. Okay? The dopaminergic cells are firing like crazy. They're getting food they really want. We're thrilled. We're hungry, and we're getting something delicious. Not much more rewarding than can happen when you're really hungry. Okay? Now they predict the arrival with the cue that you saw, a meaningless uh, st stimulus. And look what happens. When do these neurons fire? Not for the food arriving, but for the visual signal that predicts the food will come. What's delicious for the brain is the anticipation of something that's rewarding. <laughs> and this morning when I was thinking about this lecture, I was thinking, in my life, almost always, I mean, you, 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 you might tell us, Think about experiences you've had that you've looked forward to. And almost the most delicious part, you might say, is the anticipation of something delightful. Often the event itself is more mixed and, and post-climatic, anticlimactic than you would have thought. Is that, is that fair? Okay. I mean, I think there's nothing better than like, I'm anticipating something wonderful. And the event can be wonderful, but often it's a little more complicated, right? That anticipation is like pure joy because your dopaminergic system is firing freely away. Um, uh, and it protests also. So you get the visual signal that, oh, the reward's coming up, OK? Um, here it is. Here comes the food. The, war, the food doesn't come. Look at the silence. These cells are protesting you know, because they didn't get what they expected to get, OK? All right? So it's very compelling that the reward in you occurs not even so much for the reward itself, but the anticipation of the reward is where it's biologically occurring when you can anticipate and count on it correctly. So in humans, it's harder to deliver not impossible food in the scanner, so a very simple thing is done for reward, which is offering people money. So in a given trial in the scanner, you might see a meaningless cue like this, but you learn that this box predicts that you, at the end of this trial, you do many trials, you're going to get a dollar. Another one might be 10 cents. Another one, they might take away a dollar. Okay? So this is like a good one to get. Like, I'm going to get a dollar just sitting here. I'm going to get a dollar. Okay? <laughs> I mean, it's not huge. It's not the biggest reward in the world, but it's something for like, just laying in a scanner doing nothing. Um, and here's what happens. Your nucleus accumbens gets activated, this, where, where dopamine flows from the ventral tegmental area when you anticipate a reward. This is, not be, this is not when the reward comes. This is when you're anticipating the reward. Um, and here's another picture. Uh, uh, and it's most, it's most powerful for when people anticipate a gain, a reward, and less responsive when people anticipate a loss. So it's about gains. Then the same system projects to the inferior parts of your frontal lobe. So now we're moving into the neocortex. And that part of the brain seems to respond most powerfully if you get the reward. So this is really interesting. A part of your brain that responds to the anticipation, the dopaminergic reward system. And then another part of their brain that responds not whether you anticipate it, but sometimes they trick you and they say, we're going to give you a dollar. And they go, oops, we're not giving it to you. OK? This part of the brain seems to register the receipt of the reward or not. So a separation of the brain between the anticipation of reward and the response to whether you get the reward or not. Um, older people, uh, when they look at these kinds of similar reward paradigms, they respond, uh, they're less responsive to potential loss, but equally responsive to potential gain as young adults. So that's exactly responding to positive things and showing less of a response to potential negative things. So let's switch to uh, adolescence. We're going to focus on uh, adolescence now mostly for the next uh, 10 minutes. Uh, pretty, you know, you just got through that, OK? <laughs> so let's reflect back for the last couple of years. And they make the experiments because they want to put children into it a little bit more vi vivid. Here's pirates. Here's not much reward. Here's some reward. Here's a lot of reward, OK, in the scanner. And your children are adolescents or young adults. And they look in the nucleus accumbens, this uh, reward region. And look who's firing like crazy, adolescents, OK, teenagers. Um, but they're not firing like quite to see in the frontal cortex. So this is very speculative. Uh, uh, and these are partly just wide stories. But one hypothesis is this, and we're going to say in a minute more about this. 
adolescence uh, uh, is a really interesting period because it's not only when you're deciding like who you are in the world in many ways independently, it's also worrisomely for parents, grandparents, cousins, siblings, the period in life when people are most likely to put themselves at great risk. And one version of that is that the subcortical reward areas are developing way faster than the cortical areas that control and regulate your behavior, okay? So you, this goes with the stereotype, which is probably as unfair as any other stereotype of the out of control teenager, right, okay? But imagine if it were true that your reward system is very turned up for, and your cortical control system were not yet caught up to the adult level. Well, that would make you a little bit more likely to do adventuresome things, right? Because uh, the reward is powerful and the control of your thoughts about how to approach that or reject that reward are less powerful. So, uh, uh, so here's some things to think about and people worry about for adolescence. Um, 40% of adult alcoholics report having initial alcoholism between 15 and 19. Between 16 and 20, both sexes have at least twice, are twice as likely to be in accidents than drivers between 20 and 50, twice the accidental rate. Adolescents more likely to engage in impulsive sexual behavior, multiple partners. Uh, annually, three million adolescents contract with sexual transmitted diseases. So lots of things that are risky behaviors occur with high frequency in a demonstrable way on average among adolescents, okay? Uh, young kids don't drive yet. 20-year-olds are a bit more mature in their driving. Uh, so um, part of this is, again, attitudinal. Here's, here's a question that people were asked about future perspectives. They were asked, I would rather save my money for a rainy day than spend it on something fun right now, okay? <laughs> uh, uh, in your 20s, a little bit. Uh, but you know, when you're 11 to, but you know, 11 to, it's, that, I mean, that's growing, but you'll keep the dollar. But you know, the younger you are in your teenage years, the more like, who wants to wait? Let's do it now, okay? All right. So uh, moving from something fun to something experimental, um, let's put together a couple last themes. So here's a thing we did before uh, several times in this class, creating false memories. And you remember the way that they create false memories in the laboratory is they pick a word they don't present to you, like sweet. Then they ask many students to say what words go with that word, like sour or candy or sugar. They present you this list. And then they test you for this word that was not presented. And people often imagine incorrectly that they heard or saw this word, right? We've done that a couple of times. It's a way to show illusory memories. And the way we understand it is basically this. Your memory, your mind, mostly thinks about the essence of things, not the details of things. The essence of things was everything is sweet, the, the details were the specific words in the list. Okay, so let's look at uh, older adults versus younger adults, 80-year-olds versus 20-year-olds on exactly this experiment. Older adults have many more false memories and they perform less well. So here's, uh, to, here, to a scary extent, the healthy 70-year-olds, here's their real memories, here's their false memories, it's dead even, okay? Here's young people having lots of false memories but not as many as older people and having more correct memories. So older adults have more false memories because they're encoding the gist a lot, but they're losing the specifics. Does that make sense? Okay. Then you're really vulnerable to a false memory. Children, you might think, well, children, what do they know, right? Children have less false memories than you do. You would have had less false memories at age five than you would right now, which is kind of amazing. If you didn't do the experiment, you'd imagine children would be totally confused. They got a big list of words with sweet on the list. I don't know, yeah, sure, right? Okay, no, a five-year-old does better than a seven, does better than an 11-year-old, does better than a 20-year-old. Why? Why do a five-year-old have less false memories in their circumstances? Well, we understand that to be the price of having a mind that understands a lot of gist. As you become older, you understand what's important, what counts. It's not the little details. It's the big concepts, right? So here's an example of, for example, how well people can relate words across uh, sentences. And that grows from six to nine. And that's what we want. You don't want to read word, word, word. You want to say, what's the point of the sentence, right? <laughs> okay. That process of saying, I don't care about the detail. I care about the concept, the gist of the concept. It's like the chess players. You shed the specific details to gain the overall knowledge advantage. But the five-year-old 
is not making the big picture. They're just getting the little details, so they're less prone for the illusory memories. Um, and you can't, we, we, you can't see that, but this is just showing that when it comes to think, organizing memories, you see that uh, develop across uh, childhood. Okay, last couple things, because when I heard this a few years ago at the conference, I was so surprised by these findings. I'm, I've been around long enough, I don't get as surprised as often as I used to, but it's kind of really interesting, and it's a total twist, and you can, you can make a judgment call about how to interpret it. But here's the experiments and the data. So again, we have this picture that everybody likes because it fits with the stereotype, right? Uh, uh, which is the teenager out of control, their dopamine is going up there and they're saying, you know, let's go have, let's do a lot of inappropriate things because it'll be rewarding, okay? <laughs> and I know everybody's against it, but you know, all right. So that's a stereotype and probably there's something true about that. I mean, literally in the brain imaging, it looks somewhat true. Uh, but let's think about this one for a moment. So you're going to be good at this. If line A, these are lines, is longer than B, and line B is longer than line C, is A longer than C? Yes, yes. all right, yeah, okay. this is MIT, right? Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, um, now, an answer this question truly. Think about it for a moment. Person A is a friend with person B. So let's pretend you're person B and your friend was A, and you're also a friend with C. Are A and C likely to be friends? Let's think, is it, let's think about this. Is it, uh, is it mathematically transitive like this one? No. Let's think about it for a moment. In your experience through life, on average, are your friends mostly kind of going to like each other? Kind of, not all the time, but kind of? Yeah, because probably because if they like you, if one person likes you, another person likes you, you share interests, you share background to a certain extent. It's in a loose statistical way. It's not definitive like this. So let's take a look what happens when you ask these two questions. Grades one through four. Okay, these kids are just making mistakes, right? And they're getting smarter. But look at this one go up just like that. So we, could, we can say this is a growth in logical ability. This is a growth in your everyday sense that I hang out with a certain kind of person. Maybe they like football. Maybe they like you know, skating. You know, maybe they like psychology. Right? But that's the group I tend to hang out with. And they, on average, you know, if, if I have a friend it's because we share some interests or style of, of being. And if I have another friend, we probably share that too. So more than chance, you know, they might like each other. OK? Uh, so, so this is this idea that you, know, there's, you can separate out what you might call purely logical analysis of things versus, in a sense, a growth of social experience, basically. So last three slides or so. Um, you remember this from a bit back from a prior exam where we said there's a framing heuristic. If you're risk averse for gains, you're, people are risk averse for gains, but they're risk taking for losses. So if we said, here's a program, we did this before. If program A is adopted, 200 people uh, are saved, and six, and, and, uh, or here's 400 people will die out of 600. That's the same statement. But because this is stated as a, as a gain, people usually like this. Because this is stated as a loss, people usually don't like this. Adults are uh, risk averse for gains, and they're risk taking for losses. If something looks like a loss, roll the dice. If something looks like it's going to work out, go with it, even though numerically these are identical. Turns out that that attitude, uh, you can't see this, I can tell you, um, uh, is uh, not present in preschoolers or second graders. Preschoolers or second graders, when you give them these kinds of problems, they don't show the asymmetry for losses and gains. That's something that happens over time. And it's not a logical one. Logically, it should be that. So in that weird sense, the preschooler is more logical than you and I. More logical than you and I, OK? Because there's no reason to be statistically different for losses and gains. That's purely an attitudinal, emotional uh, perspective. First of all, you can hear the information seeking. Let's check it out. That's kind of interesting. Swimming with sharks. That's kind of, you know, that's kind of, right? I mean, I, I assure you, 70-year-olds are not going to go, hey, that could be kind of interesting. They're going like, no, terrible idea. Don't do it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, you, you see some peer influence, right? Yeah. And that doesn't happen with adolescents, right? <laughs> so anyway, so everybody, play, you know, when they do this, they go, oh my gosh, these are these teenagers who are going to go do all these things and get horrible sexual diseases and drive while they're impaired. And you know, that's just the beginning of their weekend, OK? All right, because they're not going to follow all the advice that we gave them for years and years and years and years at home and in school. Uh, so here's the flip on this. And just think about it for a moment. Uh, and it's, it's complicated. Swimming with sharks. The adults say, don't tell, you don't have to tell me anymore. It's a bad idea. The gist is, sharks, bad, OK? I don't even need to hear any, the rest of the story. 
adolescents start to weigh the factors. We'd be safer in a group. Is it dark or night outside? Right? You know, how, how shallow is the water? Right? There, uh, and you could say, well, that's kind of ridiculous. But it's not totally ridiculous, because when we talk about danger, those are the kinds of some of the things you might start to think about. So, uh, having, you know, so by this analysis, um, having unprotected sex. Adults, you know, bad, 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 OK? I mean, really bad. I mean, you're right? Adolescents. Well, let's think about this. Uh, you know, let's, what, what's the gain? Well, you know, we hear that sex is highly pleasurable. Uh, what's the loss? All these things everybody's telling us. What's the odds, purely statistically, that for a single sexual experience, you will have the pleasure of sex, but you will end up with a terrible disease? What's the odds for one outing? What do you think? Here's the complexity. Some people are arguing that adolescents are actually more accurate in their assessment of risk. They're not wise in their choice. Okay? Do you understand the point? Okay? But they're actually doing the calculation, whereas adults just go, sharks, bad. Sexually transmitted diseases, avoid. Okay? <laughs> because we're, you're not parsing through the exact odds and circumstances, the trade-offs between exploration and pleasure and responsibility and safety. You just have the gist, the line, that's it. That's my wisdom you know, that I've gotten. Sharks, bad. Sexually transmitted disease, bad. Okay, that's it. Uh, uh, and these teenagers are kind of curiously thinking about what are the factors. And you could say it's not the best analysis, but you could say it's almost more rational, just like the older adults will make more just errors in memory, will be more emotional in their avoidance of risk, right? OK. So, so it's very complicated. It's not just dopamine flushing. It's also in the brain, right? It's also something about how risk is perceived and understood at different ages and what information is available to you. All right. Thanks very much.